Water wars, oil wars, even lithium wars. As the climate crisis intensifies and the global population swells, we are often told that our future will be marked by a frightening scramble for natural resources. Increased competition over scarce resources is likely to contribute to internal tensions within countries as well as external tensions between countries, warned the Pentagon in 2021. But is it true? Where did that story come from? Who does it serve? And why is it so popular today? Are we really doomed to a Mad Max-style future of scarcity, competition, and violence? Or is there another way? Resource wars are nothing new. Since humankind's earliest days, we have fought one another for different types of resources. But only with the advent of imperialism did these conflicts go global, killing to obtain and control people, gold, sugar, timber, jute, rubber, furs, or any other resource anywhere in the world. Imperialism was and remains a sustained campaign of resource extraction from the global south to the north. For instance, in their centuries of genocidal conquest in the Americas, Spanish conquistadors pillaged the continent for resources, most famously precious metals. Forced indigenous labor mined roughly 80% of the world's silver up to the 18th century from one mountain alone in modern-day Bolivia, Cerro Rico de Potosí. In fact, the Spanish Empire stripped so much gold and silver from the Americas that it destabilized the global economy through unprecedented inflation. As Uruguayan writer Eduardo Galeano wrote, Latin America is the region of open veins, everything, from the discovery until our times has always been transmuted into European or later United States capital. The resources flowed out so that emergent European nations across the ocean could accumulate them. But imperialists didn't just seek gold and silver. They were prepared to wage war over all types of far less glamorous resources, even bird shit. In the 1840s, emerging capitalist agriculture began to deteriorate the global north soils. In response, millions of tons of the nitrate-rich dung of seabirds, known as guano, were imported from islands worldwide as fertilizer. Northern powers also looked to guarantee their own supplies. By 1856, the United States passed the Guano Islands Act, annexing over 100 islands as colonial possessions stretching from the Caribbean to the South Pacific. Some of the richest guano deposits in the world were found on Peru's Chincha Islands, providing roughly three-fifths of Peru's state revenue during its aptly named Guano Era. In 1865, Spanish troops invaded Peru to forcibly seize these coastal islands and their massive guano resources. The Spanish invasion was ultimately repulsed, but the conflict kick-started nearly two decades of wars along South America's western coast for control of these nitrate resources. Through the centuries, imperialists have never ceased their relentless resource wars. But given this violence, are there even enough resources to go around in the first place? As imperialists looted the global south, leaving a trail of bloodshed in their wake, the English economist Robert Malthus was busy fretting over a hypothetical resource catastrophe, namely overpopulation. Malthus claimed that the power of population is indefinitely greater than the power in the earth to produce subsistence for man. He argued, in other words, that exponential growth in human population was doomed to quickly outstrip the world's food supply. There would then be simply too many mouths to feed, inexorably resulting in starvation, war, and calamity. Or so he claimed. But this did not happen. Labor became more productive, technology advanced, and society produced more food. Compared to Malthus's day, for example, the global population and productivity of our food systems have now expanded many times over. So why didn't Malthus's crisis materialize? Because the scarcity he saw as predetermined is in fact almost always socially and economically conditioned. 
In other words, human institutions dictate how production and distribution of resources take place. We can change not only the productivity of our economic systems, but the structure of our social relations, too. Of course, there can be no question that ecological limits are real. But it is easier for the ruling class to legitimate conflict over resources as the inevitable result of scarcity rather than taking up the task of transforming how we produce, distribute, and use our resources. In his time, Karl Marx correctly identified Malthus as a shameless psychophant for the ruling classes. Marx saw the Malthusian argument for what it was, a new apology for the exploiters of labor, an attempt to blame poverty and starvation on its victims rather than the capitalist system that induced it. But if Malthus was wrong, why are billions of people across the globe still hungry? Why aren't our resources more fairly distributed? To answer that, let's take a look at one of the 20th century's most horrific tragedies, the Bengal famine of 1943, when hunger claimed the lives of between two and four million people. Then just a nine-year-old boy, Nobel Prize winning economist Amartya Sen, lived through the famine, witnessing the starvation of millions it would shape his work for the rest of his life. In his research, Sen tried to understand how such a holocaust had unfolded around him. What he found was shocking. In his landmark study, Poverty and Famines, Sen demonstrated that there had indeed been more than enough food in the region to avert the famine. There were not, as the Malthusians of his day contended, too many mouths to feed. People simply couldn't afford to buy food. The capitalist price mechanism, not an absolute lack of food, determined who lived and who died. Quote, starvation is the characteristic of some people not having enough food to eat. It is not the characteristic of there not being enough food to eat, Sen observed. Although the capitalist market acted as the actual mechanism that starved millions to death in Bengal, it was part of a plan masterminded by British imperial policy. Marxist economist Utsa Padnaik showed it was explicit British policy to inflate profits and divert resources out of British India and into the global war effort. John Maynard Keynes himself, then a colonial government advisor on wartime financial policy for India, urged this profit incentive to, in his words, quote, reduce the consumption of the poor through a, quote, forced transfer of purchasing power. For his part, then British Prime Minister Winston Churchill said, quote, I hate Indians. They are a beastly people with a beastly religion. The famine was their own fault for breeding like rabbits. Absolute food scarcity did not cause the Bengal famine, neither did supposed overpopulation, nor did any other immutable natural law. Racist imperialism and capitalism did. The 1943 Bengal famine is a dramatic and horrifying case, but it is emblematic of how these systems mercilessly enforce inequality and resolve resource conflicts worldwide. So do we have to accept resource wars as a regrettable but ultimately unavoidable feature of our coming age? The generals, war profiteers, and corporate CEOs plotting the next lithium war certainly hope you will. But theirs is just another excuse to continue the same brutal domination and exploitation of our world's resources with the same deadly consequences. Another future is possible. Despite the grave ecological challenges we face, resource wars need not be inevitable. We have the power to change our societies and our economies, to confront these challenges without war and death. As internationalists, we can fight for ecological and social justice over profit and empire. We can build institutions to democratically plan and fairly distribute our shared resources instead of enforcing capitalist scarcity or legitimizing new wars of plunder. We can choose, as Marx wrote, the revolutionary reconstruction of society 
and we can choose it over the common ruin of the contending classes, as Marx pointed out. That task has never been more urgent, for if we do not start now, the warmongers will surely have their way.